Hi everyone, it's Professor Ryan Paul, and thank you for watching my video on Act 3 of William Shakespeare's King John. First, let's review what happened in Act 2. The first scene in Act 2 was the confrontation between King John and King Philip before the city of Angiers. And if we recall, after various machinations and confrontations, that scene ended with King John and King Philip, the former enemies, allying together through marriage. King John's niece, Blanche would be married to King Philip's son, Louis the Dauphin, the uh, heir to the French throne. Of course, in doing so, this meant that the French were abandoning their oath to Constance and her son, Arthur, to uphold his claim to the throne of England. So this was followed with the scene of Constance learning about France's betrayal, their new alliance to England, and lamenting her and her son's fate. The scene ends very powerfully with Constance refusing to go see the kings to whose audience she's been called, saying that they will come to her. Her grief outweighs their authority, their commands. Now, before I get into talking about Act 3 itself, I want to raise an important question about the staging of this moment, and that question will also take us to a question about the Shakespearean text itself. Act two ends with Constance throwing herself to the ground and saying that she will not move. The kings must come to her. Act of throwing herself to the ground perhaps foreshadows, anticipates her son's later fall to his death when he tries to escape his imprisonment. The question is, how do we then transition to the next scene where King Philip and the others arrive? Does Constance remain on stage or does she leave? Well, it would make, seem to make sense that she remains on stage. She says she's not going to leave, and then for her to get up and leave the stage would seem to undercut those words and make the whole sentiment seem rather pointless. At the same time, in the folio text, the next scene lists an entrance for Constance and Arthur at the very beginning of the scene. So that seems to suggest that there was an exit. What most scholars have done, what editors have done, is assume that this is just a list of who needs to be on stage, not a list of entrances. Um, and so Constance, and perhaps Arthur as well, have remained on stage from the end of the previous scene to the beginning of the first scene of Act 3. So in other words, what editors have had to do is try to reconstruct what they think the intended staging of the play was, and amend the text in contrast, in contradiction to how it's printed, to try to restore that intended staging. Or another way to put it is that the text bears certain signs of editorial error, signs that there was a mistake made in the publication process. And so the editors have tried to explain, understand those mistakes, and then use the mistakes themselves to interpret what the intended, what the proper uh, staging should have been. This is not the only significant editorial decision that's had, that has to be made with a play like King John. Also, in the folio publication, the folio printing of the play, the act and scene division is different, and it, it appears to be uh, somewhat, again, in error. There are not act and scene divisions where uh, it seems that one would be natural. There are certain acts that appear much shorter, that, that seem to be too short. Um, so editors have tried to, again, reconstruct by comparing it to other plays, other Shakespeare's plays, and the way their acts and scenes are divided and how they are structured to try to reconstruct what the proper intended act scene division of the play was. King John is not alone in being a play that requires this sort of editorial intervention. When editing any text, there are a number of questions and uh, uh, problems that an editor has to solve, but when working with an older text, an early modern text, there are, of course, a whole host of historical issues that you have to deal with. The reason why I bring this up is to say that whatever text we're looking at, and that's even if we're looking at a first folio, printing or uh, an original printing of a Shakespeare text, there's always been some mediation between us and the text. That is, there have been decisions made by someone to organize it in a particular way, to publish it, to arrange the print on the page in a certain way, to divide acts and scenes in a certain way. So we are always looking not at a raw text, not at a text that is been free of intervention. It's not a pure text, we might say. There's always been some interpretive uh, editorial work done. So there's always some mediation between us and the text, the history that we're looking at. To say, in the very act of 
looking at any sort of text, we are making decisions about what to include, what to exclude, how to understand the links between the different parts, uh, how to understand the progression, the narrative. Um, any text that we look at, there's no innocent looking. There's always interpretation. This aligns what we do as literary critics or editors of literary texts with what's happening in the play King John itself. The characters are struggling to find meaning in history, trying to interpret the events around them and understand the path of history and their own place in it. And Shakespeare as an author and his audience are trying to make sense of these events. That's what history does. It tries to make sense of what has happened before, whether it's history as an academic discipline or history as a literary genre. It's an attempt to frame events in a way so that they have meaning, so that they make sense to us. And that process of interpretation always comes with a certain set of value assumptions that we make. The types of questions that we ask, the nature of our interpretation is going to be shaped by our perspective. An editor who's working on a text of Shakespeare asks certain questions, and the questions that they ask and the way they answer those are in some way always affected by their perspective, by their assumptions about Shakespeare. Is an error in the text Shakespeare's, or is it uh, something that we can attribute to the printer? An error really an error? Something that might seem theatrically ineffective or odd to us might just be a difference of judgment in taste. This is not to say that editors are relying on guesswork or just on their own personal tastes when they make decisions about how to edit a Shakespeare text or any other literary text. Like all scholars, they make their arguments based on their research and their evidence. All sorts of very complicated and very rigorous methods that textual scholars use in determining, for example, if an error was something that was introduced in printing or if it was something from the uh, author's original manuscript. So there's all sorts of, of methods that they can use to try to answer these questions. But still, there's always it's always a, a, a matter of choosing what evidence to use, choosing how to interpret that evidence in relationship to all the others, and ultimately, what's the argument that you're making? How are you putting the different bits of evidence that you choose together in order to try to construct a whole that makes sense? Again, the reason why I'm discussing this is because it makes us reflect on our own practice in much the same way that we're reflecting on what's happening in the text, to analyze our own methods of interpretation in the same way that we are critical of the mistakes that the characters make or the way that they attempt to interpret the events around them and the limitations that we see in their perspectives. Okay, let's talk about Act 3. The Arden editor has divided it into three scenes. The first scene consists of the celebration after the wedding of Blanche and Louis. The scene is first interrupted by Constance, who condemns France and Austria for betraying her and not upholding their claim to uh, support her son Arthur's claim to the throne of England. This is followed by the arrival of Pandolf, the cardinal from the Pope. And he's set there, sent there to ask uh, King John why John hasn't approved the Pope's choice of Archbishop of Canterbury. John defies Pandolf and, in, as a result, is excommunicated. After much debate, King Philip decides that he will break his newly established bond with King John and go to war with him on behalf of the church. The scene ends with the two, the two factions splitting off to go to their various camps, each raging against the other. After a series of alarms and excursions, we then see a rapid sequence of great successes on John's side. First, the bastard arrives with the decapitated head of his enemy, Austria. Then John arrives with the captured Arthur, and he learns that the bastard has rescued his mother, Eleanor. Things look pretty good for John, and he sends his forces back to England. John here seems to be at the height of his success. And at this moment, he turns to Hubert, who had previously been the first citizen of Angiers. This is another uh, textual issue where the question is, is this meant to be the same character, or is it just uh, the same actor playing two different characters? It appears that this is the same character, that the first citizen of Angiers, who had talked back and forth with the two kings, initially defied them, and then ultimately made the union between them, is now Hubert, this is the same person, and is this close confidant of King John. So John takes Hubert aside, to talk to him about something that he wants from Hubert, but he's unable to come out, or he's unwilling to come out and directly say it, but through some suggestion, 
we see what he wants Hubert to do to kill Arthur in order to make sure that John's reign is secure, that his claim to the throne is secure. Arthur is no longer a threat. So I want us to keep in mind how now at the moment of his greatest success, John turns to contemplate the murder of a family member. One of the ways to understand the unfolding of history is to understand it in relationship to morality. That is, events as either rewards or punishments for good or bad behavior. A narrative that fits in with many Christian and non-Christian cosmologies, philosophies. So the question we might ask is that Shakespeare seems to be setting us up to expect or to interpret this moment where at his greatest success, again, he contemplates an evil, horrendous act as perhaps a turning point, uh, a moment when John squanders his goodwill, squanders his fortune, and then brings upon his own downfall. So the question to ask is, to what extent does Shakespeare fulfill that, that expectation, or does he undermine that expectation in the way the narrative unfolds and the way cause and effect seem to be um, depicted in this play? Moving on to the final scene, we now turn to the French side. And at first we see them lamenting the great speed and the great success that John has had against their forces. Constance arrives in a great fit of despair and the king and the others try to console her, try to get her to calm down, but she refuses and uh, curses her situation, laments her great grief that her son has been taken from her and that she will no longer see him again. And in doing so, they call her mad. She denies that madness um, and longs for death. Brief Constance departs. King Philip follows to try to prevent her from doing anything rash. And we're left with Lewis and Pandolf. Lewis, of course, is despairing at his, the French forces' losses. But Pandolf says, this is now the perfect opportunity. Now this is the uh, sign that great fortune is going to come to you. And in a really amazing display of uh, Machiavellian rhetoric, Pandolf convinces Lewis that the capture and probable murder of Arthur is a good thing because it leads, it clears the way for Lewis to take, make the claim to the throne of England. And so the scene ends with them going to the King of France to declare that they think they should invade England, go to war with England. Okay, so now I want to go back to the beginning of Act 3 and lead us through uh, an initial reading, highlighting some of the important issues and moments in the text. Scene one begins again with the celebration of the marriage of Philip's son, Louis, to John's niece, Blanche. And Philip says to his new daughter-in-law, "'Tis true, fair daughter, and this blessed day ever in France shall be kept festival. To solemnize this day, the glorious sun stays in his course and plays the alchemist, turning with splendor of his precious eye the meager, cloddy earth to glittering gold. The yearly course that brings this day about shall never see it but a holy day. So he's commenting on how this day is going to be a blessing. The day itself is a blessing, is a holy day. And we see here a, a harmony in the king's mind between their actions and time itself. The sun is stopping to solemnize, to make their, uh, their celebration holy, to make it sacred. And in fact, I think there's this, there's the suggestion that they themselves are setting the time. They are the ones making the time holy through their actions. And the sun is, in a sense, recognizing that. So they are setting the time rather than time running away with them. Constance, who again has probably been sitting on stage since the end of the last scene, speaks up now to contradict what the king has just said. What he, is, he, what he calls a holy day, she calls a wicked day. And so we see Constance, the idea of constancy, she is now turned to contradiction. She says, a wicked day and not a holy day. What hath this day deserved? What hath it done that in golden letters should be set among the high tides in the calendar? Nay, rather turn this day out of the week, this day of shame, oppression, perjury. She says, what has this day, this day has it done anything to deserve this praise? In fact, the day's actions uh, the day's actions call for it to be condemned. And of course, she's not talking about the day itself. She's talking about the King of France and Austria, those people who have betrayed her. They are the ones who have acted. But she, she talks about it as though it was the time itself. 
So I think here the day stands in both as a representative of time itself or the passage of history or, or the, uh, the day as the era, the times that we are in. And it also stands in for the actors themselves, the people who set the time, the people who make the day and establish, set it as a holy day or in her mind, a wicked day called for the day to be turned out of the week just to eliminate the day altogether but if it must be if it must remain she says if it must stand still let wives with child pray that their burthens may not fall this day lest that their hopes prodigiously be crossed but on this day let seamen fear no rack no bargains break that are not this day made this day all things begun come to ill end yea faith itself to hollow falsehood change so she marks the day again to be cursed. She says women who are pregnant should hope that their children aren't born this day, that their burdens don't fall this day. And that image of the burden falling is a very complex image, I think. It's something of an ironic image to use for birth because we might assume that falling or associate falling with the idea of dying instead. So she's uniting the images of birth and death. Falling into birth, of course, falling into life is the beginning of a journey to death. And this anticipates some of her later language in this act when Constance prays for her own death. So here she talks about being born as a fall. Uh, and this might also bring us back to ideas of the fall from grace, the original sin fall from the uh, Garden of Eden. It also echoes her own situation in that her son has fallen on this day. The marriage of Blanche and Lewis marks the fall of Arthur in his claim to the throne of England. Constance's imagery here uh, unites the paradox of birth and death, of the rise of one and the fall of another. And the other examples that Constance gives are all examples of good things ending badly. Um, only bargains that are made on this day will be the ones that are broken. Sea uh, sailors do not need to fear any sort of shipwreck except on this day. This is the only day that you need to fear that your journey will end poorly. So it's the day of things ending badly. It's the day when the pregnancy ends with the uh, cursed birth of the child. And the images culminate in the idea of faith itself becoming falsehood. And this is an idea that will be repeated and explored uh, multiple, uh, multiple times through the play, the idea of faith being turned against itself. King Philip complains that Constance has no reason to berate him thus, but she then goes on to accuse him of falseness. So the idea of falsehood is now transferred onto the king himself. She says, you have beguiled me with a counterfeit resembling majesty, which being touched and tried proves valueless. You are forsworn, forsworn. So she's comparing him to a counterfeit coin, a coin that proves valueless. And there's a great irony here because coins were normally stamped with the image, the face of the king. And that's in a sense what guaranteed their value. The king stood behind the value of the coin. It was the king's face that made it legitimate. And she is saying here that the king, who himself is the guarantee of value, is the face that makes the coin uh, into a coin, that makes it legal tender, that he himself is valueless, is a counterfeit, is a false coin. And says, you came in arms to spill mine enemy's blood, but now in arms you strengthen it with yours. So she puns on the arms of war, becoming the arms of an embrace, a friendly embrace. The grappling vigor and rough frown of war is cold in amity and painted peace, and our oppression hath made up this league. Arm, arm you heavens against these perjured kings, a widow cries, be husband to me, heavens. Let not the hours of this ungodly day wear out the days in peace, but ere sunset set armed discord twixt these perjured kings. Hear me, O oh, hear me. So she, after berating the king, she then turns to the heavens themselves, calls upon the heavens to uh, uh, to right the wrongs that have been done to her. Note Constance's rhetoric and the kind of moves that she's making in her speeches. She's, she turns the holy day into a wicked day. She says the king's majesty is only a counterfeit of majesty. His warlike arms have now turned into betraying arms of peace with uh, her enemy. 
And so she finally, after invoking all of these transformations, these things turning into their opposite, she then turns to the heavens to right her wrongs. And this is a very, I think, primal image of this widow uh, uh, calling out to the heavens, this widow has no redress on earth, there's no earthly authority that will aid her, so it's only the heavens that can right the wrongs that have been done to her. We should also note that this is a very particular type of speech that she engages in at the end. She makes a curse. She curses uh, the, the bond between John and Philip. And you might recall that uh, in one of my lectures in class, I talked about how this play is kind of a transitional history play in between the earlier tetralogy of the Henry VI plays and Richard III and the later history plays of Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V. And in those earlier plays, women, female characters, were often the voice of prophecy, and they were often associated, they, they made lots of curses. There's lots of cursing going on in Richard III. And as I said, those history, the, those earlier histories have more of a sense, uh, a providential sense. That is, the history is the unfolding of God's plan. There is a meaning, there is a logic behind it. Even if it is opaque to human understanding, there is a divine logic to it. And in that sort of providential uh, narrative, the female characters, they're often the voice of prophecy. Here we see Constance, in a way, taking on the same role as many of the female characters from those earlier plays. She makes a curse, and as we'll see, her curse comes true. She says that she wants discord to uh, break the bond between John and Philip, and as it turns out, the, the bond is broken before the day is out. So. Is she prophesizing? Does her curse cause this to happen? Again, this is a play that explores how do we make sense out of history. So I think it gives us these tantalizing moments that we can perhaps interpret as cause and effect or having some connection. But are we sure? Is that connection solid? Or does Shakespeare, or how does Shakespeare uh, force us to question? How does he undermine the links between one event and another? Austria cries out to Constance to be at peace. And again, she turns one thing into the opposite. She says, war, war, no peace. Peace to, is to me a war. And then she insults him. And again, insults him by saying he appeared to be one thing, but he turned out to be something else. Thou slave, thou wretch, thou coward, thou little valiant, great in villainy. Thou ever strong upon the stronger side. Thou fortune's champion that dost never fight, but when her humorous ladyship is by to teach thee safety. Thou art perjured too, and soothest up greatness. So she insults him as one who's changeable, who swings from one side to another, goes to whoever's strongest, has no real morals or, or values, uh, has no um, loyalty except to fortune and to uh, fortune's protection. And there's a sense, there's certain irony here uh, in that Constance, who had been, in some sense, the kind of domineering, controlling mother, is now mocking Austria for, uh, uh, for being governed by a feminine power, being protected by the power of fortune. She ends her rant against Austria by pointing out that he is wearing the lion skin that he took from Richard Lionheart, but that this lion skin does not match his inner cowardice. She says, thou wear a lion's hide, Doff it for shame, take it off for shame, and hang a calf skin on those recreant limbs. Calf skin here uh, signifies his meekness and also his foolishness, and recreant limbs means limbs not made for war but for recreation, for play. Now we have a rather comic moment. moment. Austria is very insulted, but Constance, of course, is a woman, and he says, Oh, that a man should speak those words to me. And so the bastard immediately jumps in, repeating Constance's last line, and hang a calfskin on those recreant limbs. Austria says, Thou darest not say so, villain, for thy life, and hang a calfskin on, thy re on those recreant limbs. So he repeats it again and again. This is a funny moment, of course, and it brings out that conflict that's been uh, boiling between Austria and the bastard. But the other thing that's really interesting about it and odd about it is, of course, technically, Austria and the Bastard are now allies. And by echoing and taking up Constance's challenge, in a sense, Bastard is becoming her champion, be, uh, becoming part of her side. 
I said uh, when talking about Act Two, uh, this in this play we see all these attempts to cobble together different unions, but of course it's always a union of competing interests, of conflicts. So we have here a new union between France and and uh, England, but even that is split because Austria and the Bastard are at odds with each other, and that oddly leads to now the Bastard again taking up the claim of Constance. Before this conflict can go any further, though, it's interrupted by the arrival, arrival of Pandolf, and he says, Hail, you anointed deputies of heaven! To thee, King John, my holy errand is. I, Pandolf of fair Millen Cardinal, and from Pope Innocent the legate here, do in his name religiously demand why thou against the church, our holy mother, so willfully dost spurn and force perforce keep Stephen Langton, chosen Archbishop of Canterbury, from that holy see. This in our foresaid Holy Father's name, Pope Innocent, I do demand of thee. I want to point out one thing first here about Pandolf's rhetoric, and then secondly, something about how, uh, about Shakespeare's work here as an author, and how the language he gives to Pandolf fits in within the theme or the, the recurring uh, conflict between different forms of authority, the contest between who is the rightful authority. So first off, notice how Pandolf addresses the kings as anointed deputies of heaven. So in doing so, what is he stressing about their relationship to him or the relationship of their authority to the source of his authority? to establish their authority as subordinate to the authority of the church. They are the deputies of heaven, anointed by heaven. But he, as a member of the church, is speaking on behalf of heaven, or at least making the claim to. However, notice that as he makes his claim, as he makes his uh, uh, question against John, he repeatedly cites the Pope himself as the authority. He says that he's there, he's from Pope Innocent, he's demanding in his name, and then he again repeats that this is in the foresaid Holy Father's name, Pope Innocent. He specifically makes his demands on the basis of the Pope's authority, not on the basis of God's authority, not even on the basis of the Church's authority, but on the Pope's authority. And this has the effect, I think, of sort of implicitly reducing the Pope to just another authority figure. That's not to say that he's necessarily lesser than, but he is yet another person like John, like Philip, like Arthur, making a claim to power, to authority. John's defiant answer, I think, picks up implicitly on this suggestion that the Pope is just another human authority. He asks, what earthy name to interrogatories can taste the free breath of a sacred king? earthy name to interrogatories, what earthy title can taste, can demand the free breath of a sacred king? This is the contrast in language here, the earthy name versus the breath of the king, earth versus air, the physical versus the spiritual. What's ironic and unexpected is that normally we would associate spiritual authority with the church and earthly authority with the king or the government. Here, John is claiming his authority as divine. He continues this unexpected reversal where he is placed on the higher, more spiritual level in the Pope uh, as a more earthly, worldly authority when he then goes on to say to the, the cardinal, thou canst not, cardinal, devise a name so slight, unworthy, and ridiculous to charge me to an answer as the Pope. Tell him this tale, and from the mouth of England add thus much more, that no Italian priest shall tithe or toll, toll in our dominions. But as we, under God, our supreme head, so under him that great supremacy where we do reign, we will alone uphold without the assistance of a mortal hand. So tell the Pope, all reverence set apart to him and his usurped authority. On here highlights that the Pope is just a name, it's just a title. He ties himself and his own loyalty and authority directly to God, not to the Pope, and says that his power, his, his uh, reign, comes from that immortal power of God, and that he doesn't need the mortal hand of the Pope, of an earthly authority, to uphold his, his kingdom. Again, John just views the Pope, is, is calling out the Pope here as just another earthly authority. When Philip of France warns John against this blasphemy, John goes on, 
Though you and all the kings of Christendom are led so grossly by this meddling priest, dreading the curse that money may buy out, and by the merit of vile gold, dross, dust, purchase corrupted pardon of a man, who in that sale sells pardon from himself, though you and all the rest so grossly led this juggling witchcraft craft with revenue cherish, yet I alone, alone do me oppose against the Pope, and count his friends my foes. So here John attacks the venality and the hypocrisy of the church. Behind its spiritual claims he finds just greed, just the desire for money, for revenue. And he uh, says that the pardons come not from God, but from themselves. So they have a false authority in what they claim. The authority that they claim for their pardons is not really God's, but only their own made-up authority. Reading this play within the context of early modern religious conflict, uh, we can see how these speeches on John's behalf seem to give voice to very popular Protestant anti-Catholic sentiment. At the same time, John is being very brash and bold here. We might say he's being uh, very excessively rude to the cardinal. We don't, it doesn't seem that he needs to go on and on about his defiance to the Pope. And so, in a sense, he seems to bring on the, the, excommunication, the excommunication and thus the rift that will follow with France himself by making such a show of his defiance. As to John's defiance, Pandolf says, by the lawful power that I have, thou shalt stand cursed and excommunicate, and blessed shall he be that doth revolt from his allegiance to an heretic, and meritorious shall that hand be called, canonized and worshipped as a saint, that takes away by any secret course thy hateful life. The return of the hand imagery that we've seen associated with power and action. We also see the second curse of the scene. Pandolf's curse is the second one following Constance's. I think the language that Pandolf uses here is very interesting. He says, blessed shall he be that doth revolt. So we have an interesting paradox that, in fact, revolting against authority, which is normally very bad because that's disorder, that's chaos, um, is in this case good. So you have the approval to revolt, which in itself is kind of an oxymoron, to get licensed to revolt, to be to re revolt by its very nature is something that defies authority, but now this is an authority, uh, the church, that is approving or um, sponsoring revolt. Constance wants to jump on board and connect her curse to Pandolf's. She says, O oh, lawful let it be that I have room with Rome to curse a while. Good Father Cardinal, cry thou amen to my king curses, for without my wrong there is no tongue hath power to curse him right. So she holds her wrong as, in a sense, prior to Pandolf's, perhaps because it's the wrong of one family member against another. However, rejects her claim, saying, there's law and warrant, lady, for my curse. John has defied the authority of the church, has defied the church's law, so that law stands behind Pandolf's words, behind his curse. On the other hand, John hasn't done anything illegal to Constance, and as Constance will say in her next little speech, in fact, the law itself is against her. She says, when law can do no right, let it be lawful that law bar no wrong. Law cannot give my child his kingdom here, for he that holds his kingdom holds the law. Therefore, since law itself is perfect wrong, how can the law forbid my tongue to curse? This is the question of what do we do at the limits of the law? What do we do when law cannot right a wrong, when there isn't a legal recourse for some action? Again, because the law itself, in her mind here, is corrupted. What is the authority that we turn to at that point? Pandolf's excommunication, we now have a debate about whether or not France should disjoin itself from England. Pandolf tells Philip, let go the hand of that arch heretic and raise the power of France upon his head, unless he do submit himself to Rome. So the physical uh, union, the physical bond that they uh, of holding hands represents literally and figuratively the bond between them, the political union between England and France. So letting go of their hands is a breaking of that union. The debate about whether or not France should uh, separate itself from England, we see how conflicts are already starting to split these groups apart. Bl Blanche and Lewis are already put at each other's odds. Blanche arguing that the curse of Rome is the lighter, uh, the lighter curse, that is that France and England should stay united. Lewis, 
her husband arguing for the opposite. She turns to Pandolf and asks, Good Reverend Father, make my person yours. See things from my perspective. Be in my place in the unfolding of events. And tell me how you would bestow yourself. This royal hand and mine are newly knit, and the conjunction of our inward souls, married in league, coupled and linked together with all religious strength of sacred vows, the latest breath that gave the sound of words, was deep sworn faith, peace, amity, true love between our kingdoms and our royal selves. And even before this truce, but knew before, no longer than we well could wash our hands to clap this royal bargain up of peace, Heaven knows they were besmeared and overstained with slaughter's pencil, where revenge did paint the fearful difference of incensed kings. And shall these hands, so lately purged of blood, so newly joined in love, so strong in both, unyoke this seizure and this kind regret? Play, fa play fast and loose with faith? So jest with heaven, make such unconstant children of ourselves as now again to snatch our palm from palm, unswear faith sworn, and on the marriage bed of smiling peace to march a bloody host and make a riot on the gentle brow of true sincerity? O oh, holy sir, my reverend father, let it not be so. Out of your grace, devise, ordain, impose some gentle order, and then we shall be blessed to do your pleasure and continue friends. Now, at the beginning of the speech, Philip repeatedly uses verbs and nouns suggesting union. Knit, conjunction, married, coupled, linked, vows. So these are all words that are suggestive of union. Also that these are rather personal verbs and they like he's using images related to marriage, interpersonal connection, to represent the union between England and France emphasizes just how recent this union is and how very recently before it the two were at war. The hands that are joined together now, they had just washed the blood off of them. So we have also returned to the imagery of hands. The imagery of washing blood off of one hands, one's hands always brings to mind the, the reference to Pontius Pilate attempting to wash his hands of the guilt of being involved with the execution of Jesus. The question, can you ever be washed free of your guilt? Can the sin, can guilt, can blood ever really be washed off of your hands, off of your soul? Here, Philip is implying that they had just cleansed themselves of this blood and now they're friends again. But I think the irony is, of course, that the conflict is still there, uh, the, the contest between the two, the violence is still simmering underneath them, and we're going to see it just uh, erupt again in a moment. What it seems to be doing here is to point out to Pandolf that by breaking this bond that they just made, they'll be proving themselves unfaithful. So he's pointing that he has a certain, he's in a kind of catch-22. He's trapped because he doesn't want to prove himself unfaithful to mock God by making a vow and then breaking it so quickly. In response to Philip's requests, Pandolf says the only way for him to be faithful is to break his faith. That is, he has to be faithful to the church, he has to break his faith with England. Pandolf then goes on to warn Philip what the consequences of keeping his oath to England would be. So makest thou faith an enemy to faith faith turned against itself. And like a civil war sets oath to oath, the oath to England against the oath to the church. Thy tongue against thy tongue, what you're speaking now against what you spoke before. Elaborates on this principle in a very complicated set of uh, equivocations and paradoxes. Thy vow first made to heaven, first be to heaven performed. That is to be the champion of our church. What since thou sworest is sworn against thyself, and may not be performed by thyself. For that which thou hast sworn to do amiss is not amiss when it is truly done, and being not done, where doing tends to ill, the truth is then most done, not doing it. He's saying, um, breaking the oath to England is not amiss, since by, it, by doing something amiss you're actually serving the truth, that is the truth of your vow to the church. To not fulfill an oath, to not to not fulfill the oath of loyalty to England, is to actually serve the truth. You're serving the oath by not fulfilling the oath. You're serving truth by not acting. 
act of purposes mistook is to mistake again. Though indirect, yet indirection thereby grows direct, and falsehood falsehood cures as fire cools fire within the scorched veins of one new burned. So things become their opposites. Pandolf here is in some way echoing Constance's uh, rhetoric, but he is much more conscious about what he's doing. He's being very, um, uh, very carefully Machiavellian here in his equivocations. They're all very calculated political statements. It is religion that doth make vows kept, but thou hast sworn against religion. So we have a, another paradox. So religion in the sense of faithfulness and truthfulness is what he's talking about, but also religion in the sense of the church itself, the institution that underwrites, that guarantees or gives meaning to that faithfulness. So it's only faithfulness when it's faithfulness in the eyes of the church. Faithfulness to King John is unfaithfulness in the eyes of the church to say that these contradictions that King Philip is in, where he's made an oath that contradicts another oath, uh, extend to a, and create a kind of inner conflict. He says, thy later vows against thy first, first is in thyself rebellion to thyself, and better conquest never counts, canst thou make than arm thy constant and thy nobler parts against these giddy, loose suggestions. So he phrases it now as not only a sense of loyalty to uh, the church, but loyalty to oneself and the need to conquer the unruly parts of oneself. The contrast that Pandolf is exciting the English to revolt against their king while he's telling France to control the revolt within himself. Ends by hammering home the consequences uh, if King Philip defies him. The peril of our curses light on thee so heavy as thou shalt not shake them off but in despair die under their black weight. Notice the pun, the, they will light on thee, that is, they will rest on ye, you, but light versus heavy. The curses that seem light now, that are just words, will be heavy and painful uh, uh, punishments if you defy us. Subtle play on words that again emphasizes Pandolf's skill at equivocation. Lewis now step in, Lewis urging his father to disjoin themselves from England, while Blanche says, upon thy wedding day against the blood that thou hast married. So Blanche recognizes that this is tearing their new marriage apart. The marriage itself is already being, uh, the marital partners are being pit, pitted against one another because of this uh, new conflict. Lewis, what motive may be stronger with thee than the name of wife? To which Constance, Constance replies, that which upholdeth him that thee upholds, his honor. Oh, thine honor, Lewis, thine honor. So he has this conflict. Lewis has to choose between his wife and his honor. Two different authorities, two different motivations, two different uh, loyalties that he has. France decides to disjoin himself from England, to take up uh, the church's cause against England. And we see the contrary reactions of Constance and Eleanor. Constance says, O fair return of banished majesty, while Eleanor replies, O foul revolt of French inconstancy. Fair return versus foul revolt. And of course, they're both right. They're both correct from their perspective. That Constance's curse from earlier in the scene has now been fulfilled. There's a certain irony, though, that her desire, uh, when she had called to the heavens and she had wished for her son, for that hell for her son to become king, Fortune had not helped her, but now that she's at her lowest point, Fortune seems to side with her, at least for the moment, by granting her wish to, to split England and France apart. Another one of the many examples of uh, events that seem to have a kind of cause and effect or that seem to have a kind of narrative logic, but when we think about it, that logic is really rather unsatisfying and doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And responds angrily to France, France, thou shalt rue this hour within this hour. So remember that in Act Two, uh, France had been surprised by just how speedy John had been, that he'd been very expedient, rapidly arrived in France almost even before the ambassador. So this recalls that, and John is promising return to that kind of speed and efficiency, that effective, powerful leadership. Her part very poignantly expresses her situation. The sons were cast with blood. Fair day, adieu. Which is the side that I must go with all? I am with both. Each army hath a hand, and in their rage, I having hold of both, they whirl asunder and dismember me. Husband, I cannot pray that thou mayest win. 
Uncle, I needs must pray that thou mayest lose. Father, I may not wish the fortune thine. Grandam, I will not wish thy wishes thrive. Whoever wins, on that side shall I lose. Assured loss before the match be played. So she pictures herself, notice how she pictures herself the, this, as a violent physical dismemberment. Again, her hands being torn, her body being torn apart as she grasps the hand of each side. Imagery of physical suffering is then echoed by John, who characterizes his rage as a fever, which, again, foreshadows um, the fever that he will suffer from later in the play. He says, France, I am burned up with inflaming wrath, a rage whose heat hath this condition, that nothing can allay nothing but blood, the blood and dearest valued blood of France. Fran uh, Philip replies, thy rage shall burn thee up, and thou shalt turn to ashes, ere our blood shall quench that fire. Look to thyself, thou art in jeopardy. No more than he that threats to arms let's hide. So the uh, scene ends with the two vowing to defeat the other 